G'day mate, Forty here. So I started blogging July 3rd, 1997. That's the time I first bought like a real PC computer and within, within an hour of unpacking it, I was setting up my own pages on AOL with my AOL account and I, I started blogging. And I, I enjoyed the freedom of blogging and so that allowed me towards the end of 1997 to do something that I'd, I'd wanted to do for about eight years and that is I wanted to engage with Dennis Prager's thought by writing my own thoughts often in reaction to his thoughts so so much of what I do on YouTube is you know reacting to somebody else and that's true of intellectual discourse in general like, knowledge is really a conversation and so the the socially acceptable means of effectively participating in knowledge is to acknowledge what someone else has said on topic A and then add in a wrinkle or add in a disagreement or take, take topic A and, and move it forward in some way. So I would listen to Dennis Prager on the radio sometimes for two, three hours a day and I had thoughts that I wanted to share on what Dennis Prager was, was saying. And so I thought, now I've got a blog. I'm into blogging. You know, let me go forward. Let me start writing my reactions to Dennis Prager's radio shows. And when I started articulating this out loud to my closest friends at the time in Los Angeles, so by this time I'd been in Los Angeles for about three and a half years, uh, these were all friends that I shared in common with Dennis Prager. They were friends in large part that uh, I... Would, would dub in with, that I would attend uh, Stephen S. Wise Temple with. And uh, they all said, look, if you do this, we will never speak to you again. Because until this time, I'd just been another acolyte of Dennis Prager. I had told him how much I enjoyed his, his books and his lectures and his writings. And uh, you know, there was no like public you know, challenging of, of anything he said. I was just a fan. And I wanted to weigh in and uh, share my own thoughts on what he was talking about. So then I would move from, from fan to, to critic. Okay, Cri not critic in the sense that I was criticizing everything he was saying, but critic in that I wanted to place what he was saying in some kind of context. So just like a, a Bible critic is not someone who is trashing the Bible, the Bible critic is someone who asks, when was this document written? For whom was it written? what was what was going on at that time right who wrote it when was it written for whom was it written that those are the basic questions of literary analysis and so i was was planning for years and years to to move from just you know dennis prager fan to engaging with with his thought and integrating it into my own writing so when i did that i lost you know virtually all the the friends that i had in los angeles which was incredibly painful and uh, you know, brought me low and and I was in a you know pretty desperate you know pathetic place for for many months after that into into May June of 1998 so from December 1997 to May June of 1998 I was in a pretty low desperate place because I don't know what your experience is like but for me life with community and friends is five times more enjoyable, five times more intense, five times more exciting, five times more fulfilling than life with, you know, very little community and friends. And l life with community and friends is also about 20% as desperate, right? You know, tough times come for everyone. When you have community and friends, tough times are, are about halved or they're about, you know, one-fifth the power that they bring one-fifth the challenge that they bring when you're largely on your own. So I was just reading a New York Times article on Francis Fukuyama. He's most famous for coming out with an essay on the end of history in 1989. So he, he essentially argued that there was no alternative to liberal democracy. This came out in the National Interest magazine, summer of 1989. Now, I think that's just an absurd point. I, I don't find Francis Fukuyama a particularly useful, powerful, 
influential, you know, I, I don't find him an important thinker. He's not someone, you know, I really want to wrestle with. But he did say one interesting thing in this article that that struck me. Oh, yeah, that's that's true. That is a really good point. So he found that fame made him, quote, less reliant on the good opinion of a circle of friends. So I think the normal healthy response to life is particularly for, for intellectuals, is that you limit what you say to those things that won't damage your friendships and won't damage your standing in the community and won't damage your career. So for most of the people, my peers that I know well, for them, their, their career comes first, probably for most of them. And if it's not their career, then it's their family and friends. So most normal, healthy people they circumcise what they say, they circumscribe what they say, they limit what they say to that which it will be acceptable within their community, within their, their friendship circles. Uh, I have generally gone through my life saying what I wanted to say and then dealing with the repercussions. So Dennis Prager said on the radio, he's never lost a friend. I can't say that. I've gone through life like ticking off friends all the time. I remember when I was in high school, just entering a new high school, and I wanted to investigate uh, you know, bad behavior by the football team. And, and my perhaps best friend at the high school at the time said he was initially enthused about what I was doing. And then he just completely cut me off and said, look, you can't, you can't investigate and humiliate y your own school and, and its own programs. And so that, that was like a really painful break. And we didn't speak for, for about a year after that. So... I've had that experience again and again and again. I would speak out on something or I'd write something and then lose friendship. I remember when I was converting to Judaism, 1992 to 1994, uh, I had, had a good friend, a woman who was also interested in converting to Judaism, but she was a public school teacher. And because I was volunteering with a referendum to encourage school choice, to encourage people to, you know, that that would allow people to send their kids to private schools to get a voucher from the state. She cut off that friendship because I, I went to work on this uh, pro school choice advocacy. So I've experienced this again and again and again. I take some position. I, I participate in some social political cause that uh, my friends disagree with passionately. And then boom, there goes the friendship. Now, the, the advantage of of my approach of like saying and doing what you believe and pursuing truth as you see it is that you you do make new friendships you you meet you meet up with uh, people with whom you having you have things in common but it's really hard to go through life without friends and I've had many you know dark times desperate times because I've ticked off all my friends. And so one of the advantages of fame is that it makes you less reliant on the good opinion of a particular circle of friends. So starting in May, May and June of 1998, I started becoming famous. There were all these articles written about me. I appeared on Entertainment Tonight. I appeared on uh, 60 Minutes. I appeared on, on Fox. Uh, I, I was written up in New York Times, LA Times. You know, I was written up in Rolling Stone, all these publications. And so I was less, you know, less needy for friends because one, all sorts of people that I used to know, like came out of the woodwork and, and got in contact with me. It's like, oh, look, I just saw you on TV. I just read about you in Rolling Stone. So someone who I went to UCLA with, like contacted me uh, 10 years later, say, hey, I just read about you in Rolling Stone magazine. So that's one of the great things that I found about fame is that I've been able to replenish the friends that I've lost from the controversial things that I was saying. I've been able to replenish them through through becoming famous. Now, the downside is, starting in late 2007, I, I realized I'd no longer be able to make a living as a writer, and so I, I stopped putting as much effort into my writing, and my, my social circle moved away from primarily being with writers. So between between about uh, 2002 and 2007, almost all my socializing was with fellow writers. I'd go to writer groups, Los Angeles Press Club functions, uh, book readings, and, and that was my community because I, I was 
famous as a writer and you know, I was connecting with people as a writer and um, you know, people who write for the New York Times, right? Adam Davidson, he, he's, uh, isn't he an economic, uh, correspondent for the, for the New York Times, right? You know, he, he hit me up as like, wanted to meet me, you know, had lunch with him. He's a contributing writer for the New Yorker. So I got to know all these people from the New Yorker, New York Times, LA Times, and that formed my social circle. But once I started seeing, I was hitting the wall that I could no longer financially support myself as a writer and, I downgraded the importance of writing in my life, then that whole social circle and, and the friends that, that came with it just largely started dropping away. And so I had to remake my life again. So I became an Alexander Technique teacher. I, I developed friends in, in the Alexander Technique community, but there was there was a lull and there was a drop off. So I lost one, one set of friends. I lost my, my social circle, I lost my, my writing community in large part. And uh, it took, you know, it took a few years to start building up these alternative communities, which was painful. I remember I was dating a woman in 2009. She said, you know, you have no friends. Well, I was in that lull because most of my friends had been writers. Now that I was no longer primarily devoting myself to writing, I couldn't keep up with that friendship circle that I had. And friendships take a lot more maintenance than family, right? You can see a sibling or an uncle or an aunt or a niece, right, for the first time in 10 years, which I've experienced. Like, I, I think I went 10 years without seeing my brother. And then, boom, you just start right off where you where you were. And you can't really do that with friends. Friends requ require a lot more maintenance. So the normal thing is that people devote themselves to their family. Now, almost all my, fam all my family is in Australia and has been for the last, pretty much the last 20 years. So people who are not absorbed by their family will, will then naturally become absorbed by their, their relatives, their, their extended family. Like that's the natural human condition. First of all, you prioritize your kids. So if you've got a good friend, but he's now married with kids, you may not want to see him you know, very much because his kids are so demanding. They're so annoying. You know, they take up so much of his attention that you may make plans to go see a movie with him. You make plans to go have coffee with him. You may make plans to, you know, play tennis with him. And half the time he'll have to cancel or leave early or he'll be running really late because family comes first, right? That's the natural, normal thing. Family comes first, you know, job comes first, career comes first. And then after that, your extended family comes first. And then if you have any room after taking care of your job, your career, your family, your extended family, if you have any energy and time after that, any need for human connection above and beyond that, then you fill it with friends. So people who are actively involved with their family and extended family, they don't tend to have nearly as many friends. People like me who live on another continent from my family, then my life is primarily about friends. And, and, and community because there are no, there's no one, you know, within 3,000 miles of me with whom I, I share any blood relation of which I'm aware. So then you can experience the downsides of the, the loss of fame because when you, you lose the fame and you lose the stature that goes with it within a particularly highly competitive industry such as, as writing, then you know, that substitute community, those substitute friends that you develop through your friendship well, they, they will largely go away, right? If, if your friends are primarily in the writing community, as mine were, and I ceased to primarily be a writer and uh, wasn't putting my energy into writing, then all the, those friends, all that community just, just kind of disappears. So I love that, that little bit in this Francis Fukuyama article that uh, one, one advantage of fame is that you're less reliant on the good opinion of a circle of friends. Now, also, I think there are certain strong individuals who, for whom ideas are so compelling that they're willing to risk social isolation and that they can, they can deal with it. I, I think I'm a little bit that way. Certainly, I'm not happy when I'm socially isolated, but ideas are often so important to me that I'm, I'm willing to pay the price for the social isolation that will come for saying unpopular things. Now, in 2004, Fukuyama broke with his fellow neoconservatives 
over what he saw as a delusionally sunny assessment of the Iraq war. So all those people who supported the 2003 Iraq war, who were pundits and writers, they paid virtually no price. And almost all the people who were right about what folly it would be to invade Iraq in 2003, they received no benefit. All right? So Nick Fuentes is a millionaire off of Super Chats, but far more profound thinkers than Nick Fuentes. All right, they, they've got bupkis, right? So, so fame and fortune don't always go to the wise and, and to people who are putting out uh, ideas and insights with, with great merit. So in 2004, Francis Fukuyama blasted people like columnist Charles Krauthammer for promoting a reckless nation-building project untethered to reality and betraying neoconservatism's traditional wariness of grand social experiments. And uh, when he did that, he lost a lot of his friends, right? Probably most of the friends that he gained through being famous were fellow neoconservatives, and then he lost them all by taking an unpopular position. So he found the schism difficult but liberating. And I found the same thing, with, say, when I, I fell out with the Dennis Prager crowd. Very painful, very difficult, but, but liberating to be able to go my own way. And he said, I could think on my own. So ties are wonderful. Ties make life you know, far more exciting, far more pleasurable, far more comforting. But ties, ties bind you to others, obviously, but they also blind you. I'm just quoting Jonathan Haidt. You know, when you're connected to a community, when you're connected to friends, right, you, you become blind. And sometimes when you fall out with friends and community, the, the veil is removed from your eyes and you start seeing things more clearly. Now, often seeing things more clearly will cost you friendships, will cost you a social circle. So to try to maintain both, one has to be in the dance of connection, but also be able to step outside of it and see things how an outsider would see what's going on. You cannot join any group, any community, without participating in essentially a cult. All right? that, that's just the nature of community. All communities have uh, characteristics of the cult that you don't see once you're inside the dance. But if you're smart enough, you can step outside of the dance and, and put yourself in... The, the minds of other people who are outsiders who are looking at what your group is saying and doing. I remember uh, I, w I was with some Orthodox Jews and, and, you know, one of them started yelling out like death of the Palestinians. You know, who knows how many non-Jews around us heard that. I, I, I don't think that was like a really savvy thing to say that when you're so intoxicated by your in-group identity, you know, yelling out things like, you know, death to the out-group just, just becomes normal. So Jacob Heilbrunn is the author of They Knew They Were Right, The Rise of the Neocons. And he notes Jacob, uh, that Francis Fukuyama had a more reality-based perspective than his ex-friends, like Charles Krauthammer. So he notes intellectuals have a predilection for extremism. Yeah. And uh, Francis Fukuyama came out of an extreme movement, meaning neoconservatism. But I think he managed to keep his bearings. All right, let's have a look at the chat. Luke's priorities, crystal light, Ricola, <laughs> beef organ pills. Now, my priorities are ideas and people. Sometimes I'm more excited about ideas than my connections. Most of the time, I'm more excited about my friends and community than I am about ideas. Friends, family, community, these things are fleeting. The glory you will gain as a member of the old ride is eternal. <laughs> Those who don't send you super chats aren't your real friends. I want to have sex with every woman that I see. Is that normal? Yes, that is normal. But it also reflects, you know, where is that coming from? It reflects a certain emptiness inside of you. Like our basic addictions are for love, right? That's our basic addiction for, for the one third of the population that's susceptible to addiction. The basic addiction is love, but you can distract your yearning for that kind of connection with you know sexual fantasies with with drugs with alcohol with gaming with, with gambling etc but the basic thing that a third of the population is susceptible to addiction are yearning for is connection and so by walking around thinking about how you desperately want you know how much you want to have sex with every woman you see that's distracting you from your core pain and your core pain is that you're not feeling loved and you're not loving and you're not connected to other people and so 
when you're living a life that's disconnected from others, you will do anything to distract yourself from that pain. And so your, your sexual obsessions are adaptive in the sense that they are distracting you from your core pain of feeling unloved and disconnected. But this, this obsession and distraction will quickly become maladaptive and lead you into ways of thinking and behaving and speaking that will limit your ability to create love and connection in your life. Luke, I'm playing tennis with someone who's definitely better than me. What do I need to do to defeat him? I always found when I played tennis with someone better, that always lifted my game. I mean, that was fantastic. I couldn't believe, like, I was able to stay on the court with someone who was on the Nevada Union High School tennis team. I was never on any official tennis team. But the, the thrill of, you know, taking on someone who was so much better than me, like, all my senses became heightened. Hit to his back end, bro. Maybe you have to approach the net more often. Mm. Not many people can uh, win at the net. My game is a big serve, and I'm an endurance-based baseliner. Keep your unforced errors to a minimum. Ultimately, Luke has the final word on the subject because Luke is the decider. Intellectuals tend to stay in an abstract space. They're able to be intellectuals. They're much more likely to be shielded from consequences than normies. Yeah, the smarter someone is, the more they live in an abstract world. Right? The more they live in, in the world of ideas and in abstractions. And so probably the better suited they are for dealing with things like COVID and, and dealing with, with things like being alone. Even the idea of distinguishing normies from oneself is a red flag. Yeah, generally speaking, the most effective way to go through life is to see what you have in common with other people. But if you've got something important, some, something burning inside of you, even if it makes you unpopular, if, you, if you're producing something of significance, then that significance will keep you warm even when the things that you're saying and writing uh, socially isolate you. How does Donald Trump win if he is banned on socials and on YouTube? Because apparently YouTube won't allow any extended speeches by Donald Trump. Uh, great question. Recall a situa situational sweets now that everything is situational with the Luke Ford empire. Lemon, honey, sugar-free, Recola, definitely the way to go. Bye-bye.